So I'm mostly going to be talking about my role as a research fellow in the High Tech Out Car project and the research that I've been doing on phenites within that project. So I'm going to be moving completely away from the porphyry and the sulfur things that we've seen um, for much of, much of the meeting. And I'm going to be talking to you about carbonatites and alkaline silicate complexes. Now, the models for these complexes haven't actually considerably progressed since the initial one that was outlined by Labar in 1977. And this is now a very much outdated model. And due to research that's been driven by exploration, we've now highlighted many questions that aren't actually outlined by this model. So those are listed on the right-hand side here. And you can see from the cartoon that there is very much a simplification of these systems. So it's not highlighting any temporal or spatial relationships. It's not highlighting any phenotization processes. And probably most importantly, it's not highlighting any ore deposit formation processes. So that is why High Tech Out Carb was born. It is the brainchild of uh, Professor Francis Wolfe from down at the Camborne School of Mines. And I think I actually have to legally tell you that it's a European Union Horizon 2020 funded project. So we've got lots of different partners all across the board. So from UK institutions, uh, we have the BGS survey, actually uh, Natural History Museum, for which many of you are here today. Uh, we've got international institutions as partners, so University of Tübingen, Gaius, which is the geological society which covers um, geological survey, which covers Denmark and also Greenland, and we also have industry partners such as Terratech and Makango, based over in Malawi. So each of these partners are basically grouping together to try and provide a workable model that can be used by exploration companies to determine what they have in their complexes in their license area and where the enrichments are within their systems. So thanks to people like Alan Woolley from the Natural History Museum and his database of alkaline and carbonatite complexes, we know pretty much where these systems are throughout the world. We've got a lot in Africa, we've got a lot in Russia, but we don't know where the enrichments are within the systems themselves. So each of the different partners is looking at a different aspect of the system to group together to find a model that exploration companies can use to better pinpoint their drilling, which is the most expensive part of the exploration process. So myself down at Camborne School of Mines, I'm looking at the phenite surrounding carbonatite and alkaline processes. Uh, our Scottish partners are looking at the upper section of the magma chamber and the fluid processes that are happening there. Our Czech partners are looking at the upper set of the system, so intrusions, extrusives, things like that. And also we've got German partners which are looking at the geophysics of the system and things like borehole logging. So moving on, so most of you probably know uh, what I mean when I say carbonatites, so an igneous rock with over 50% carbonate mineralogy. But probably fewer of you know what I mean when I say phenites. So these are basically a metasomatically altered aureole which forms around these carbonatite and alkaline silicate complexes. So where we have an intrusion coming up in the middle, it basically expels lots of pulses of alkali-rich fluids, which add alkalis to the country rock and basically remove the silica, effectively metasomatizing that rock mm. in situ and forming different aureoles of altered rock around the outside in a process known as phenotization. Now, phenites are both temporary and spatially zoned. We tend to have an initial pulse of phenotization, which forms this sodic alteration shown in green. And these are generally very much associated with veining episodes. Uh, you can see here, this is a sample from uh, Nakhalonje over in Malawi, which is a big carbonatite complex. And it doesn't show up very well here, but we've got a vein of sodic amphiboles and pyroxenes, which effectively brecciate the original country rock. And this is a wide feature throughout most of the, uh, the sodic alteration aureole. Now, in the centre and later, we have this potassic alteration aureole, which is shown in pink, and it may or may not be brecciated. But these tend to be formed from uh, potassium feldspars, so your microclines and your sanadines in here, and also metal oxides. And these are very characteristic out in the field. You can see this is, again, an example from Malawi, which is uh, Chenga. <coughs> so... Why are phenites important? Why, as um, sort of geologists 
interested in economic mineralisation, should we care about them, or from any point of view in terms of the mineralogy? Well, firstly and pot uh, potentially most importantly, these aureoles, these metasomatic aureoles and the phenites, form around rocks which are our most important source of niobium and rare earths within the world. So, these are very important metals in terms of our technological advancements, and also China has monopolized the production. So 83% of the world production of rare earth was uh, produced by China in 2016. So that is a very shaky supply of rare earth. And if we want a very reliable source, then we need to develop these economic deposits within more friendly and feasible countries, such as, for example, Europe and Africa. So secondly, Phenites form very distinct alteration aureoles within, within the field. So going out into the field, you can very easily recognise these alteration patterns without the need for drilling and without the need for expensive lab techniques. So it's very easy to be able to see them within the landscape. Now, we've had a lot of talk on porphyry coppers in the past couple of days, and it's the same sort of set of alteration aureoles around the outside that's been so successful in the past in finding metal deposits related to igneous intrusions. And in that regard, phenites do have a very similar potential in order to find those enriched carbonatites and those enriched alkaline silicate intrusions in the centre. Okay, thirdly, and possibly most importantly in terms of using it for exploration, these phenotizing fluids are expelled in multiple pulses from the intrusions. And they're very rich in ligands. So, for example, things like chlorides, fluorides, very rich in that. And these actually complex with the rare earths and complex with the niobium, which massively increases their solubility within aqueous solutions. And they're able to mobilize the enrichment of rare earths and niobium within the central intrusion and take them out into the peripheries of the aureoles. And where we've got those fluids carrying and mobilising the rare earths and niobium, we form these micromineral assemblages within the phenite that are enriched in these metals. So, for example, here we've got an SCM image from Songwe in Malawi, and these are rare earth rich fluorocarbonates, which form in relation to other carbonates and apatites within the phenite. And similarly, this is a carbonatite complex in Sokli over in Finland, and we have niobium rich pyrochlor, which is forming within one of these adrene veins, which is so indicative of the phenites. So, where we have these enrichments in the phenites, we can also infer that we have enrichments from the source intrusion from which the fluids are coming. And the eventual goal of this project, and the eventual goal of my role within the project, is to basically be able to say, right, we've got X amount of rare earths within the phenite, and therefore we can infer a direct relationship of X amount of enrichment within the source carbonatite or alkaline intrusion. But unfortunately, that is a work in progress. So fourth uh, reason is that these fluids are very enriched in alkalis. So Okaruso over in Namibia, the fluids coming from there actually have 30 weight percent sodium and potassium. So we're talking about a considerable amount of alkalis in these fluids. And within the literature, there is a massive deficit in terms of describing these phenites. So essentially, if you've got a description of your very economically enriched intrusion and not the associated phenite, you're effectively ignoring potentially 30% of the alkalis that would have been in that original magma. So you're essentially ignoring that enrichment that potentially could tell you something about your original magma. So, for example, in Fen over in Norway, this is a plot of alkalis against silica. The crosses show our original protolith composition. And you can see that we've added between about 3 and 10% alkalis to our original country rock, which is a sub substantial amount of elements to completely ignore from your system. So that's why they're important both economically and to our igneous petrology. But how can we potentially use them as an exploration indicator? Well, this is, as I said, a work in progress, and much of my geochemical data has either yet to be processed or yet to be obtained. But we can see from the field work that we've done, we can still already see relationships that are building up. So we can hypothesize from these. So where we have brecciation in hydrothermal or intrusional environments, it suggests we have explosive release of either fluids or volatiles coming from that source intrusion. And there has been a link between brecciation and enriched sources of rare earths and niobium already. 
So essentially what's happening is as we cool and exolve our source intrusion, it's continuously exolving fluids which are released as pulses into the surrounding country rock. And as you continue to exolve your fluids and continue to evolve your intrusion, that is where we get the niobium enrichment building up in our intermediate generations and our rare earth enrichment building up in our later generations of our carbonatites. So where we have, oh, sorry, where we have brecciation occurring, this is where we're most likely to get our enrichments in rare earths and niobium. And a similar story is happening within our veining. Veins are indicative of phenotization processes. And where we've got more complex veining textures, more cross-cutting textures, that is where we're seeing more and more pulses of fluid coming out from our source intrusion and where we're most likely to get our enrichments in terms of rare earth and niobium. But we don't just see these multiple pulses within the vein textures. We also see them within the mineralogy of the phenites themselves. And this builds up zones within the phenite mineralogy. And these are very clear within the amphiboles and within the pyroxenes of the phenites, but also show up very nicely under cathodoluminescence. So this is an apatite from Sockley over in Finland, beautiful euhedral apatite. And we've got an inner red-blue core, which contains inclusions of calcite, We've got a middle green zone, and we've got an outer purple rim. Now, each one of these is luminescing differently because it has a different geochemistry. And that allows us to essentially determine the chemistry of the fluid that precipitated that zone of the appetite at the time. Now, as I said, we have lots of ligands within our, within our phenotizing fluids, and that means we get a lot of mobilization of niobium and rare earths. And we again see this coming out within the phenite. This is a basnosite crystal and a monazite crystal in an orthoclase matrix from Mountain Pass over in the USA. Now, this is a highly enriched source from the US, which has actually unfortunately gone out of production. It was producing rare earths. But you can see here, this is within the potassic phenite. We're actually seeing that mobilization firsthand. So moving on to the chemistry of these fluids. So as I said, we can fingerprint these fluids because the zones of the different minerals are precipitating directly from that phenotizing fluid. So what we did is we analyzed each of the zones using laser ICPMS, and we came up with some chemical trends. So essentially what we're seeing from the central section of the appetite towards the outside is an increase in sodium, strontium and total rare earths. So we have less in the middle and a much higher concentration of rare earths within the outside of the phenite. So this essentially means that over time we're evolving our fluids and we're evolving our intrusion to have more and more sodium, strontium and rare earths. So you can see that from this uh, chondrite normalized plot. Please excuse the clunky Excel graphs. We only got the data on Friday night, so I haven't time, time to make them look pretty. But we've got the same colors. So our green is our central section, our red is our core, and our purple is our rim. And you can see a progression from the central sections of the appetite towards the more rare earth enriched uh, rim of there. So we've also got uh, a massive yttrium negative anomaly there, and that's most likely due to co-precipitation of a phase that is actually including that yttrium. That's most likely amphibol in this case, which is a very important mineral within the phenite system. It's absolutely everywhere. So that's most likely being incorporated within the amphibol. So moving on to that trend that I was on about, the stront uh, strontium and the sodium, you can see clearer within the strontium glass strontium versus total rare earths, we've got a clear progression from our core, our red and our green in the centre, to our purple rim. So our strontium and our sodium are increasing at the same time as our rare earths are increasing. Now that is something that's been identified within all appetites within carbonatite systems and is important in also determining the phenotizing fluid composition. And the fact that we can see that within the fluid that's coming out of these source intrusions means that we can use it as a way to determine whether we've got enrichment in our carbonatite source. So this is because we've got basic substitution of sodium and strontium for our calcium within the appetite lattice, and that is essentially causing a charge imbalance, which is sucking the rare earths into the appetite at the same time. So that's why we see this general progression of all of the elements. 
So we didn't just analyse our nice mineralised systems, we also analysed our unmineralised systems because if we had exactly the same trends between both, it wouldn't make for a very good exploration indicator. So here we have a completely unmineralised system from Tororo over in Uganda. And you can see, firstly, we've got a completely different set of zones. We've got a green inner zone and we've got a purple outer zone. Now, when we analysed these, we found that there was no clear trend between the zones. There's no clear progression of sodium and strontium. And what we actually have in the central section is high manganese, which is why you've got that nice green luminescence. When we come out into the outer zones, the purple sections, we've actually got a complete reverse of what we see in the mineralised systems. We've got low sodium, we've got low strontium and high silica. So a complete reverse of what we see at Sockley. The one thing that we did note is within these uh, red-green zones, we do have high niobium. So we know that those intermediate fluids coming out of our carbonatite in, um, in Tororo has high niobium. So just a comparison, we have a complete mess in terms of the rare earths. Rare earths are relatively low, there's no clear trend, but we do still have that yttrium anomaly there showing amphibol precipitation. And again, in complete contrast to Sockley, our sodium and our strontium shows no clear trend. So our unmineralized systems are not showing these nice, clear sodium, strontium and rare earth increases that we see throughout the evolution of our carbonatites. So what can we conclude from these observations? Uh, well, firstly, we have a clear indication that they have the potential to be used as exploration indicators. We not only have these main physical uh, features, such as brecciation and veining, but within the micromineral assemblages, we also have these zonations, and we have these rare earth-enriched mineral assemblages that suggest that we can actually imply from our phenites what we have within our carbonatites and alkaline systems. Now, these phenotizing fluids, because they have that high proportion of ligands, are mobilizing our rare earths and our niobium, and that is why we can fingerprint from these different zones within our minerals the fluid state at the time, and therefore infer from that our carbonatite and alkaline enrichment at the time of evolution. And last but not least, phenites are massively underrepresented. The literature has absolutely well, not absolutely nothing, but very much underrepresented compared to the intrusions. And if you're describing your intrusion and not describing your alteration, you're effectively ignoring a lot of the stuff that comes out of it into the surrounding country rock. So we're talking rare earths, strontium, calcium, barium. All of those things are being mobilised and not being recorded if the associated phenite isn't recorded with them. So... Thank you very much for listening. If anybody has any questions in terms of the other areas of the project that I haven't gone through today, we have a website, a fieldwork blog, and also a Twitter feed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Holly. Um, I think we've got time for some questions. Yes. Um, just out of interest, what's the pH um, temperature? Um, so phenotizing fluids, um, roughly about 500 degrees. In terms of the pH, there isn't much to say about the pH. Um, but there is actually some discrepancy between what people think of phenotizing fluids and what people think of in terms of temperature. So recent studies um, done by Emma Dalman suggest that phenotizing fluids are about 100 to 200. But for example, all of the fluid inclusion studies done in Ambadonga, which is a massive... Um, complex over in India suggests about 500 to 600 degrees. I could go home and describe my thin eye <laughs> John. Sorry, can get back again. You can't make a, an yttrium anomaly by crystallising amphibole. It doesn't work like that. Amphibole takes the adjacent mm -hmm. rare earths. You can only make an yttrium anomaly with, with fluorine. Okay. Yttr yttrium is not a, a proper rare earth. It doesn't have an incomplete... F shell. So the only process that really fractionates yttrium from holmium is, is, is fluorine. So it's the fluorine concentration in the exactly. fluid so rather that's, than that's the obviously evolved, and that's So the, the magnitude of the yttrium anomaly is telling you something about the amount of fluorine. So oh, if, you that's at, interesting. if you look at fluorite melt partition coefficients, they have this enormous uh, yttrium anomaly in the way that you don't get with, with amph amphiboles and other um, 
uh, other silly cake meals. Oh, brilliant. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, Charlie. Yeah. Could I just follow up on that? And you mentioned ligands. Mm -hmm. Are the barren uh, carbonatites, do they have as much fluorine in them as the mineralised uh, carbonatites or not? So not so much work has been done um, possibly quite considerably on the unmineralized systems, but uh, Williams Jones has estimated that you've got about 500 ppm of fluorine within sort of the ore forming fluids that are coming out. Um, so unfortunately, I can't tell you in the unmineralized systems. We do, uh, following on from uh, John's point, have a much smaller yttrium anomaly, so that might suggest something. Um, but in terms of phenotizing fluids in unmineralized complexes, a lot less work has been done, unfortunately.